All right, well, it is our question and answer night once again. And I'm going to do a very bold thing and try to cover two questions tonight. I have noticed that whenever I cover the more difficult question first, we never have more time left over at the end. So I'm going to pick the one that I think is slightly easier, and, or at least uh, slightly less involved, anyway. You know, it's a little more general. And then we'll branch out from there. And the first, I, I kind of pick, I'm kind of not going precisely in the order that they're received. I've trying to stick mostly to a first come first serve policy but sometimes when questions have related subjects connected to them I think you know maybe it would be good to cover them at the same time too so well if you were kind of wondering hey you know I submitted my question ages ago and he hasn't gotten to it yet eh, maybe I'm planning on grouping it with something else it's not that I have forgotten about you um, unless you're trying to figure out how many angels will dance on the head of a pen uh, sorry I don't know um, Anyhow, uh, the first question I have for tonight is this. Is anybody besides Jesus resurrected who died by being executed? Is it always natural causes or illness? Uh, and is that significant or is there a reason? Basically, you know, the question is, you know, out of all the resurrection stories we read in the Bible, what was the cause of death? Was it always some kind of death, or, uh, disease or injury? Or were there executions and murders thrown in as well? And I think this question was prompted a little bit by the fact that when we were studying Acts, we noted that people like Dorcas and Eutychus are raised from the dead, but not Stephen or James, people you, know, you would think would be resurrected. And so I, it, the question kind of stems out of that idea anyway. And, well, to answer, it's really only, we only got to list the, the times in the Bible where people are raised from the dead. And... As far as I know, and someone can call me on it, uh, there's, uh, there's ten specific instances in the Bible where people are raised from the dead. Elijah, in 1 Kings 17, raised the son of the widow of Zarephath. Elisha raised the son of the Shunammite woman in 2 Kings chapter 4, in verses 32 through 35. Uh, in 2 Kings 13, there's kind of an interesting story where Elisha himself is dead, and they put his body in a tomb, and a few months later... Uh, there's a band of raiders that attack a, uh, another burial party, and they throw the body of the guy they're burying into Elisha's tomb. But when the guy lands on Elisha's bones, he comes back to life. So Elisha is still performing miracles even after he's dead. Elisha was pretty cool like that. But that is another instance of resurrection, number three. Number four, Luke chapter 7, Jesus raised the son of the widow of Nain. Uh, number five, Jesus raised the daughter of Jairus from the dead, and that's recorded in three different Gospels, uh, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, in John chapter 11, number six, Jesus raised Lazarus, who was dead for four days. And number seven, there was an instance in Matthew chapter 27 where when Jesus died, the sky was darkened and the veil of the temple was split, and all of the tombs, it said, opened up and people who were dead came out and showed themselves elves alive in the city of Jerusalem after he had raised from the dead. Now that's a pretty bizarre story that isn't recorded in any other gospel and you would think it would be a little more earth shattering than literal, simply the literal earth shattering that takes place to get them out of the tomb. But that's number seven. Number eight, Acts chapter nine, Peter raised Dorcas from the dead. Number nine, Acts chapter 20, Paul raised Eutychus from the dead. And number ten, which I'm not going in chronological order, but it's the most important by far, Jesus himself being raised from the dead. All right, well, the question put in parentheses, besides Jesus. So, you know, Jesus being executed. Uh, but the question is, you know, is Jesus' resurrection basically unique? Well, what do we know about everybody else's death circumstances? Well, uh, six of them, we know how they died. Well, well, six of them, we know that they died of illness. The son of the widow of Zarephath, the son of the Shunammite, the son of the widow of Nain, Jairus' daughter, Lazarus, and Dorcas. All died from illness. Pretty straightforward. One of them died of an injury. Eutychus fell out a window because Paul talked too long and uh, he got drowsy. Uh, the only two that we don't know the circumstances of their deaths are the, the crowd resurrection in Matthew 27 and the guy who Elisha raised from the dead post-mortem himself in 1 Kings 13. We don't know how they died. So it's basically an argument from silence at that point. The only person on the list who, was, who we know for certain was killed by execution was Jesus. 
So, to answer the questions, three parts. Number one, is anybody besides Jesus resurrected who died by being murdered or executed? The answer is, not that we know of. But, it's an argument from silence. Uh, there's at least two resurrections where we don't know the circumstances of death. Question two, uh, is it always natural causes or illness? Which is basically the same question. In all of the cases that we know of, minus Jesus, it's fair to say Jesus' resurrection was somewhat different. Uh, so that there's two cases, again, where we don't know the cause of death. And the third question, is that significant or is there a reason? Well, it depends on how definitely you feel about questions one and two, doesn't it? If there is a significance, and this is a contingent response, it is more of a broad application of this principle. That the resurrection of Jesus was a kind of vindication, if you will. Uh, man judged Jesus to be guilty and killed him unjustly, and God overturned man's verdict and raised him from the dead. And similarly, anybody who's murdered or killed unjustly must await their vindication as well before they can be raised from death. A passage that may support this idea is in Revelation chapter 6 and verses 9 through 11. In Revelation 6 and verses 9 through 11, it says... That when the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each of them a white robe and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed even as they had been would be completed also. Now, in other words, their vindication hasn't happened yet. Now, Jesus, his vindication has already happened because he's been raised from the dead. 1 Peter 2.23 says that he was entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And as a result of that, in 1 Peter chapter 3, in verse 18, it says that Christ died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, or perhaps better translated, by the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. The flesh, in other words, mankind, puts him to death, but the Holy Spirit raises him from the dead and overturns their verdict. That's the first of vindication, the first fruits of resurrection, which will continue. And the resurrection itself becomes proof that nobody can permanently harm us. Now, is Jesus' resurrection special or unique? Well, yeah, it is. Because unlike other people who were resurrected... Uh, Jesus never dies again. In Romans chapter 6, it says, uh, in verse 9, that we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. And again, in Revelation chapter 1, whenever Jesus appears to John, uh, Revelation chapter 1 in verse 18, it says, I am the living one, I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and of Hades. That is the thing that sets Jesus apart from all of the other people in the Bible who are resurrected. You know, the, the widow's sons, uh, the guy who Elisha raised, Lazarus, all of them eventually die again. They are still mortal. They haven't really been resurrected in the same way that Jesus was. Jesus, by contrast, was raised from the dead and he's not going to die again. He leaves his grave clothes behind, as opposed to Lazarus, who comes out with his grave clothes. And he goes on to become Lord of the dead and of the living. So that's basically uh, the bottom line on it. Now, I don't know if the dichotomy between dying of sickness and dying of murder is part of that. Could be, but it's not clear. So, anyhow, that's the, sh that's the answer, uh, at least as far as good as I can get to the question. Which is basically, we don't really know for certain, but here's a couple of ideas to think about. Any comments or questions on that? particular set of questions. Okay, well, that was one question. We got through one question in like record time. Alright, second question, and this one, uh, this one I think, actually the answer is pretty straightforward as well, but I want to spend a little more time on it because of kind of how it keeps coming up in society. And this question is, how do you explain people seeing things, or people that appear and they know that they have died, which I assume is talking about the kind of the, the near-death experiences that people have had. You know, people die on the operating table and they have a vision of heaven or of angels or something like that. Uh, 
Well, I, I had to do a little research to, get, I guess, get more of these claims. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to just kind of, I don't know if I'm going to read all of these because there's a lot of them, but uh, I'll just put it this way. You want to make a lot of money, and I, I have the ultimate get-rich-quick scheme. So, you know, if you want to make a lot of money and you have no integrity, you can do this. Write a book that says that you died and went to heaven. You'll sell a million copies and you'll make a million dollars. It's very, very easy. Because that's what everybody does. Um, and Don Piper, 90 Minutes in Heaven, a, a true story of death and life. As he is driving home from a minister's conference, Baptist minister Don Piper collides with a semi-truck that crosses into his lane. He is pronounced dead at the scene. For the next 90 minutes, Piper experiences heaven, where he is greeted by those who had influenced him spiritually. He hears beautiful music and feels true peace. Back on earth, the passing minister who had also been at the conference is led to pray for Don. Even though he knows the man is dead, Piper miraculously comes back to life and the bliss of heaven is replaced by a long and painful recovery. For years, Piper kept his heavenly experience to himself. Finally, however, friends and family convinced him to share his remarkable story. I'm reading a lot. Some of these I'm going to read the book description that you can find on Amazon just to kind of give you the idea. So uh, just you know, bear with me on that. Uh, published in 2015, Christy Wilson Beam, Miracles from Heaven, A Little Girl, Her Journey to Heaven, and Her Amazing Story of Healing. Annabelle Beam spent most of her childhood in and out of hospitals with a rare and incurable digestive disorder that prevented her from ever living a normal, healthy life. One sunny day, when she was able to go outside and play with her sisters, she fell three stories head first inside an old, hollowed-out tree, a fall that may well have caused death or paralysis. Implausibly, she survived without a scratch. While unconscious inside the tree, with rescue workers struggling to get to her, she visited heaven. After being released from the hospital, she defied science and was inexplicably cured of her chronic ailment. Uh, from an interview that she gave, it was really bright, and I sat on Jesus' lap, and he told me, whenever the firefighters get you out, there will be nothing wrong with you. Annabelle recalled, and I asked him if I could stay, and he said, no, I have plans you need to fulfill on earth that you cannot fulfill in heaven. Um... You know, and here's just just a few others in here. Um, Mary C. Neal, to heaven and back, a doctor's extraordinary account of her death, heaven, angels, and life again, a true story, 1999. You know, of course it's a true story if you market it that way, right? Uh, in the 1999 in the Los Rios region of southern Chile, orthopedic surgeon, devoted wife, and loving mother, Dr. Mary Neal, drowned in a kayak accident. While cascading down a waterfall, her kayak became pinned at the bottom and she was immediately and completely submerged. Despite the rescue efforts of her companions, Mary was underwater for too long and as a result, died. To heaven and back is Mary's remarkable story of her life's spiritual journey and what happened as she moved from life to death to eternal life and back again. It's eternal life. We're back again. Just stretching the definition of eternal there. Uh, detailing her, finding, her feelings and surroundings in heaven, her communication with angels, and her s deep sense of sadness when she realized it wasn't her time, Mary shares the captivating experience of her modern-day miracle. Uh, although uh, some of the reviewers of this book complained that the book isn't really about her heavenly experience, it's just about her life after the fact. So, uh, buyer beware. A particularly famous one, Todd Burpo and Len Vincent, Heaven is for Real, a little boy's astounding journey of his trip to heaven and back. I actually have this one in my office. Uh, a young boy emerges from life-saving surgery with remarkable stories of his visit to heaven. Heaven is for real is the true story of the four-year-old son of a small-town Nebraska pastor who, during emergency surgery, slips from consciousness and enters heaven. He survives and begins talking about being able to look down and see the doctor operating and his dad praying in the waiting room. The family didn't know what to believe, but soon the evidence was clear. Colton said that he met his miscarried sister, whom no one had told him about, and his great-grandfather, who died 30 years before Colton was born, and then shared impossible-to-know details about each. He describes the horse that only Jesus could ride, about how really big God and, taught, uh, God and his chair are, how the Holy Spirit shoots down power from heaven to help us. Told by the Father, but often in Colton's own words, the disarmingly simple message is, heaven is a real place, Jesus really loves children, and be ready, there is a coming final battle. This work, actually, is unique in some ways because it has also spawned a movie, and they're writing a sequel, because apparently Todd Burpo doesn't have enough money. But my personal favorite, slightly less well-known, but my personal favorite account is this one. Kevin and Alex Malarkey. No. Don't laugh. That's their names. Don't make fun of people's names. That's not nice. Um. Published in 2014, The Boy Who Came Back from... 2014... Now, well, that, that's probably a different edition number. I don't know why I wrote 2014. The Boy Who Came Back from Heaven, a remarkable account of miracles, angels, and life beyond this world. In 2004... That's the real date, okay. Kevin Malarkey and his six-year-old son, Alex, suffering a horrific car accident. 
Uh, the impact from the crash paralyzed Alex, and medically speaking, it was unlikely that he could survive. I think Alex is going to be with Jesus, a friend told the stricken dad. But two months later, Alex awoke from a coma with an incredible story to share of events at the accident scene and in the hospital while he was unconscious, of the angels who took him through the gates of heaven itself, of the unearthly music that sounded just terrible to a six-year-old, and most amazing of all, of meeting and talking to Jesus. The boy who came back from heaven is the New York Times best-selling true story of an ordinary boy's most extraordinary journey. As you see heaven and earth through Alex's eyes, you'll come away with new insights on miracles, light beyond this world, and the power of a father's love. Now, why do I pick that one as my personal favorite? Because of what happened in January of this year. In January of 2015, Alex Malarkey wrote the following open letter to Christian publishers. He said, Please forgive the brevity. Because of my limitations, I have to keep this short. He's quadriplegic as a result of his injury. I did not die. I did not go to heaven. I said I went to heaven because I thought it would get me attention. And when I made the claims that I did, I had never read the Bible. People have profited from lies and continue to. They should read the Bible, which is enough. The Bible is the only source of truth. Anything written by man cannot be infallible. It is only through repentance of your sins and a belief in Jesus as the Son of God who died for your sins, even though he committed none of his own, so that you may be forgiven. May you learn of heaven outside of what is written in the Bible. Not by reading a work of man. I want the whole world to know that the Bible is sufficient. Those who market these materials must be called to repent and hold the Bible as enough. In Christ, Alex Malarkey. He issues a retraction. And his mother, Beth Malarkey, has also made several public statements to the same effect, which is basically that this whole thing is made up, basically. I really tried not to say Malarkey there. Um, now, there is one person who has refused to recant the story. The father, Kevin, has refused to recant the story. And as a result of that, Beth and Kevin have been estranged for several years. Of course, um, I'll let you guess who's actually making the royalties off of the book. Uh, just saying. <laughs> there's a lot of these books, and I've got more, and we could get into a lot of it. And there's really too many of these books to read and review and assess all of the cases individually. I want to say something, though. People have been writing about near-death experiences for a long time. This has been something that, it's like a whole other genre of literature. It's only been in the last decade, though, that it's had this, this uh, evangelical Christian spin on it. These evangelical publishers have gotten a hold of it and decided this is a ripe market. Uh, one major obvious problem, I'm going to quote here from Phil Johnson, the Burpo Malarkey Doctrine. One major obvious problem is that these books don't even agree with one another. They give contradictory descriptions of heaven that cannot possibly have any cumulative long term effect other than the sowing of confusion and doubt. And just to give you an instance of what that means, Colton Burpo, he gets a halo and a wings in his story, uh, even though he's in heaven for like three minutes. He sat on Jesus' lap while the angel sang to him, he did homework. I'm not making that up. Uh, he also met the Holy Spirit, who he says is kind of blue. Uh, Malarkey claimed there was a hole in outer heaven that leads to hell, and the devil can come and go as he pleases and looks really scary. Okay. Now, what do we do with all that? How do I explain that? I guess that was what the question is. Uh, well, my first explanation is follow the money, because, I mean, that's, that's a good chunk of it right there. Um, 90 Minutes in Heaven sold 6 million copies. Heaven is for Real has sold over 10 million copies. The boy who came from heaven continues to sell copies even though the boy in the story has issued a public retraction. People are still buying it. You can't let the genie out of the... Well, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. You know, you can't stuff toothpaste back into a tube. Once it's out, it's out there. And so these books continue to sell ridiculous amounts of money and people continue to get rich off of these stories. And you know, people will ask, well, you know, you believe in a miracle too, don't you? You believe in the resurrection of Jesus. That's true, I do. You know why I believe in the resurrection of Jesus? Because the eyewitnesses didn't have anything to gain from the story. That's why. Yeah. Follow the money. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's Peter, Paul, the apostles. Did they get rich off of it? Did they make a bunch of money? No. Everybody hated them and drove them from city to city and, had, and eventually they were killed. Does that sound like something that is a profitable market or an exploitative device? No. Instead, everybody hated them and persecuted them and most of them were killed because they refused to recant. Now, why in the world would you knowingly lie? And that's the key qualifier here. There's people that, there's people that die for lies all the time 
it's much more less likely for people to knowingly die for something they know to be a lie. And you contrast that with Todd Burpo and Kevin Malarkey and these other guys. As a result of their testimony, well, they've become obscenely rich and made tons of money. And, well, they even get a major motion picture made about one of them. So why would they lie? Well, that, why would they make that up? Why wouldn't they? I mean, I think that the, the motive presents itself. Okay, all right. Well, 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 what about children? Children wouldn't lie, would they? Well, well, I mean, Alex already admitted to making the story up because he wanted attention. But you know something else? I'll tell you, children can be very sincere, but children have active imaginations. You know, no, no, I'm, I'm, this is a true story. My son claims to have been to heaven and back. He does. He's claimed that. You know, we were sitting in our living room one day, and he was climbing up on the couch. He said, Daddy, look at me. I'm in heaven. Oh, really? What do you see? Oh, I see clouds and birds and airplanes and Jesus and all that. Other stuff. You know, I... Now, what is that? Is that an active child's imagination, or is that a genuine, you know, paranormal experience? Well, it's not that hard to figure out and piece it together, because children do that, because children are imaginative, and it's okay for them to be that way. What's not okay is when you start exploiting things like that for personal profit and gain. Uh, and, you know, now, some of these people had near-death experiences, and, you know, I think it's possible. The near-death hallucinations are pretty commonly repor reported. I say hallucinations. That bias is what I think about them, obviously. Let me ask you a question. What does the Bible say about people who get a glimpse of heaven? Does anybody in the Bible go to heaven and back? Well, yeah, actually. People in the Bible do go to heaven and back. Let's look at one of them. Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Yeah, yeah, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's look at this. And... I'll tell you, it doesn't happen very often in the Bible, which is kind of interesting because we've, we've had, I mean, most of these books on this sheet were published in the last decade, and I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different cases in just the last decade of people that claim to have been to heaven and back. In the Bible, there aren't that many. Kind of interesting that the apostles would not get this such benefits, but let's keep reading. 2 Corinthians 12, Paul is in the middle of kind of a discourse against his opponents, and one of the things he says to his opponents is that, basically, you haven't, um, you know, he's kind, of, he's kind of mocking their apostolic boasts a little bit. But in chapter 12, he says, boasting is necessary, though it is not profitable, but I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. Okay, this is really exciting. We're going to talk about visions. Paul says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a man was caught up into the third heaven. I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. On behalf of such a man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except in regard to my weaknesses. For if I do wish to boast, I will not be foolish, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from this so that no one will credit me with more than he sees in me or hears from me. Now... We know that in the first century, there were people who were claiming to have visionary experiences and using it to puff themselves up. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 18 talks about, Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of the angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen inflated without cause by his fleshly mind. So this is a real problem and it existed in the first century. Now, Paul talks about a vision, a man in Christ who has a vision, and it becomes clear as we read the story that the man in Christ he's talking about is himself. I don't know why Paul refers to himself in the third person, but he does. And what kind of vision is this? Is this vision, I'm just kind of, I'm going to throw out some words here, and you tell me which one better fits his vision ignorance or knowledge? Knowledge? Do you think knowledge describes the vision? Look at, look at what he says in the vision. Uh, I know a man in Christ, whether in the body I do not know, or out of the body I do not know. God knows. Such a man was caught up in the third heaven. I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know. Uh, and then he goes on to talk about how he's heard inexpressible words, which he's not permitted to speak. Yeah. About 
the only thing he knows is that God knows stuff and that the vision happened, which, I mean, and we can figure out that God knows stuff without having the vision. But there's so much. He says, I don't know about this, I don't know about this, I don't know this, and can't tell you the technical specifics. There's a lot of details in this vision. And we're, we read something like this in Paul's story, and we're going like, what, what, you couldn't get more information than that, Paul? I don't know. I don't know what. He's, he's the one that had the vision, and he doesn't know what its character was. Was it a private vision or a public vision? No. It was a private vision. You know, it's only public because he talks about it here. Uh, but Paul hadn't share, apparently hadn't shared this with anybody until now. And he's not, you know, and still not public after the fact because guess what? He heard, what he heard, he's still not allowed to tell you. He heard inexpressible words, but the man is not permitted to speak. You've got to keep this secret, Paul. You can't tell anybody what's said here. Okay? Was this vision humiliating or exalting? Which one of those? Humiliating or exalting? Hmm? It was humiliating. Why? Hmm? Okay, yeah. Well, if we assume it's the same as Acts 9, yeah. But we also know what Paul himself says after this in verse 7. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the standard for Paul's visions. Ignorance, not knowledge. Private, not public. Humiliating, not exalting. The thorn in the flesh was a direct result of this vision. And what about the false apostles? Well, the false apostles were doing the exact opposite of that. They were using their visions to claim special knowledge. They were using their visions to boast publicly. And they were using their visions... And they, were, they had real visions, but where's their thorn in the flesh? Where is their humiliation to keep them from exalting themselves? I have the same question. I have some of these, you know, if, if these are real visions, why do they know so much? Why do they boast about it publicly? Where is their thorn in the flesh? I have those questions for Colton Burpo, for Mary C. Neal, for even Alexander, and for others. Why do they know so much about what they saw? Why are they talking so much about it? And where is their thorn in the flesh? I think those are valid questions. Because the only, there's actually, the only person on this list who suffers an obvious permanent physical damage in connection with his vision was Alex Malarkey, who we noted already retracted his statement. He's the one claiming his vision was a lie. I mean, what do you do with that? Any other places in the Bible where people have heavenly visions? Okay, Stephen, well, which immediately happens afterwards as he gets stoned to death. All right. Who else? Well, yeah. It wasn't even a transported to heaven vision. It was just something he saw from the earth with heavens open. Right. Anybody else taken to heaven? Taken up into heaven in a vision? Hmm? Okay, Elijah was taken into heaven. All right. The Apostle John. Okay, yeah, that's the other big one in the New Testament we can't forget. Uh, the Apostle John. Is taken up in the I mean, that's how he describes it in Revelation 4. Oh. Yes, Jed. Okay, yeah, that was a, more of a vision that he had on earth, but yes. Um, you know, he saw the stairway to heaven, the ladder to heaven. In Revelation 4, this is what I was getting at more, actually. After these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven... And the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, I will show you what must take place after these things. Well, John gets a heavenly vision when he writes Revelation. And, well, it's, you've got the same problems, don't you? You know, it's, it's a vision that is one of, turned into one of the most cryptic and difficult texts in Scripture for a lot of people. Because so much of it's not explained for us. John's vis heavenly visions draw heavily on Old Testament imagery and spend an awful lot of time describing not what's going on in heaven, but what's going down on earth from heaven's perspective. John doesn't really tell us a lot of the details about heaven. When you think about it, uh, you know, he says some things in chapter 21 and 22 about the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. And he talks a little bit in Revelation 4 about the throne of God. 
you know, he who was sitting on the throne was like a jasper stone and sardius in appearance, as that's the only description he gives of God who sits on the throne himself. Much more details devoted to the surroundings, as in typical in Old Testament throne scenes. And even, there's stuff in the vision of Revelation that we don't know what was said. Revelation 10.4 the seven peals of thunder had spoken. I was about to write. I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up the things which the seven peals of thunder have spoken, and do not write them. John couldn't tell you everything he heard in his vision. And it's amazing how many people think that they know what the seven peals of thunder said, even though John wasn't allowed to write it down. That's pretty impressive. Okay. So here's what I am trying to figure out. And this is, this is why I think... And this is my difficulty with this. Why is it that when John and Paul, the apostles, have heavenly visions, they're persecuted and they can't tell you all the details, but when all these other people who coincidentally make a lot of money off of their heavenly visions have heavenly visions, then it's their daddies that hear everything, publish the story and get rich. Well, something about that situation doesn't quite add up. Does it add up to you? Okay, all right. But Wayne, you know, aren't you being unfair to people? Aren't you being unfair to people's uh, credibility? What if somebody genuinely was sincere in the experience that happened to them? You know, sometimes people really are sincere about their experiences, aren't they? You, know, you can't just slap them down for that. So let's just imagine for a second, let's pretend that a, one of these near-death experience heavenly visions actually happened. For the sake of argument, let's, let's just assume that one of them actually took place. What does it change? Does it, hmm? it doesn't change anything. We are an angel. Exactly. Galatians chapter 1 and verses 6 through 9. Paul says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of God for a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we've heard, or what we preach to you, he is to be accursed. I don't care if an angel from heaven tells you this. Don't listen to him. You're supposed to follow what we've already taught you. Jeremiah chapter 23 is instructive in this principle too. Jeremiah lived in a time of a lot of false prophets. And what does he say about this? In verse 25, he says, I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy falsely in my name, saying, I had a dream. I had a dream. How long? Is there anything in the hearts of the prophets who prophesy falsehood, even those prophets of deception of their own heart, who intend to make my people forget my name by their dreams which they relate to one another, just as their fathers forgot my name because of Baal? Okay. But does Jeremiah deny that they're having these dreams? Keep reading. Verse 28. The prophet who has a dream may relate his dream. But let him who has my word speak my word in truth. What does straw have in common with grain, declares the Lord? Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer which shatters a rock. Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, declares the Lord, who steal my words from each other. Behold, I am against the prophets, declares the Lord, who use their tongues and declare the Lord declares. Behold, I am against those who have prophesied false dreams, declares the Lord, and related them and led my people astray by their falsehoods and reckless boasting. Yet I did not send them or command them, nor do they furnish this people the slightest benefit, declares the Lord. You see what Jeremiah is saying? Saying, number one, their dreams are false. Number two, even if their dreams were true, so what? The prophet who has the dream can relate his dream, but you still have to relate the word of the Lord. They don't give the people any benefit. There is no benefit in claiming a dream visionary experience apart from the Bible. Because we have no way of verifying it. We have no way of trusting it. Even if it really happened, none of us would have any means by which to evaluate it or consider it canonical. And therefore, it doesn't really help anything. We know that if it contradicts what's in the Bible, it's not truth. Deuteronomy 13 condemns any prophet or dreamer of dreams who gives you a sign or wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes true concerning which he spoke to you, saying, let us go serve other gods whom you have not known, let us serve them. What does he say to do? Verse 3, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Well, yeah, there it again. Deuteronomy acknowledges the possibility that some false prophet would show up, have a dream, and it would come true. And he would predict something that would come true in the future. Guess what? 
If he's telling you to go serve other gods, you still don't listen to him because he's wrong. The Lord is testing you. Don't trust him. So here's what the bottom line is. The Bible doesn't deny that people have visions. I've seen Christians try to make this huge apologetic argument that there's no way God could ever speak to anybody today. We don't need to prove that. Burden of proof is on the person that had the vision. And for that matter, it doesn't change anything. The only thing the Bible does say about it is that these visionary experiences are not a substitute for what God has said. So I won't deny such experiences are possible. But I think I can be forgiven my blatant skepticism of book writers whose heavenly visions are not consistent with the Bible nor each other, but only with their pocketbooks. There is one other factor in all of this, and that is people really do have near-death experiences. You know, and they'll report things like, you know, seeing the light at the end of the tunnel or... Uh, you know, the soul leaving the body, the out-of-body experience, the feeling of inner peace. Uh, not, the experiences aren't all universal. Some report more negative emotions, and some people even report emotions bordering on suicidal. Now, I'm not a medical expert, so I can't comment informally on medical matters. I can only list a bunch of possibilities that have been proposed and tell you that they're out there. Uh, and, but there are numerous positive physiological explanations for what happens at death. Some think it's a dissociative defense mechanism that the mind engages in when the body is in extreme danger. Uh, some people cite limbic lobe syndrome as a release of endorphins into the brain. Uh, there's various chemicals. There's a paper published in the 90s uh, that suggested that ketamine, the intravenous injection of ketamine, is capable of reproducing all of the features of the near-death experience, which are commonly described in the most cited works in the field. That's a paper by a guy named Carl Jansen. Um, another paper suggests serotonin had a role to play. Another suggested a release of DMT, which is an acronym for chemical I can't pronounce. Uh, uh, yeah, trip to me. I can't say that. I'm not going to even try. No, so, um, some people suggest a connection with G-force loss of consciousness, false memories, disruption of cerebral blood circulation, stimulation of left temporal lobe, REM sleep and lucid dreaming. Uh, you know, the list goes on and on and on. And these are all different things. And maybe there's more than one. It's, I don't know. That's not an exhaustive list, and I don't have the know-how to evaluate such claims. Let me ask you a question. Does a purely physiological explanation rule out divine intervention? Not necessarily. I mean, the Lord made the body. If somebody has a, you know, sees a light at the end of the tunnel while they're on their deathbed, well, it's partly because of the way the Lord made the body and programmed it that way. You know, so He made the body. He can do what He wants with it. Um, if God speaks to people in dreams, like He does throughout the Bible, theoretically, He could speak to people in dissociative states. I don't know why He would, but... I've never had a visionary experience of any kind, but I have the scripture. And scripture is what's needed for life and godliness. God has given us all that we need for life and godliness. And we can't change what the Bible says just because we perceived a visionary experience. Even if we were sincere in that experience, we can't change what the scripture teaches about basic subjects like salvation in Christ and you know, the nature of God's people and all that. So, you know, if, if in the what-if sake of argument world, one of the people who wrote these books was actually telling the truth, it wouldn't change anything. How do I explain it? Well, at the end of the day, here's the possibilities. They're lying about what they saw, or they're telling the truth about what they saw, but they're misremembering it because memory is a weird, funny thing that messes with people's heads. Or they're truthful about what they saw, but they're mistaken about its implications. Or four, well, they're right about what they saw, but it doesn't change anything. That's what we're left with. Okay, that's... Is that supposed to do that? I get that. It does it again, I'm just going to switch it off. Um, and we're basically at the end of this anyway. Does anybody have any uh, just thoughts or comments they want to share before we uh, conclude this tonight? I mean, I mean, that basically, no, that's basically all I have to say on the matter. Um, I realize that maybe that's not the most edifying subject to discuss for everybody, but it, it, this is out there, and if you, somebody submitted the question, so somebody's wondering about it. So, there you go. I hope that that was helpful and edifying in some way. If you're here tonight, and well, I mean, the exhortation from 
one of the retractors is that we need to do what the Bible says. One of the things the Bible tells us that we need to do is we need to be immersed into Christ for the forgiveness of our sins in order to be saved. Now, maybe there's someone here that hasn't done that. Maybe there's someone here that realizes maybe that they haven't lived up to the expectation of their immersion or they haven't stayed in Christ. And, you know, whatever the need may be, it's why we're here. To help bring each other to Christ. Bring each other to the Lord. And we were all trying to help each other get to heaven. Because heaven really is for real. And it's so much more grand and glorious than any New York Times bestseller could describe it. It can't be described in human terms. Except in what we have in the scripture. But even then it has not yet appeared as what we will be. We know that when we see him we will be like him. We will see him as he is. I want to be there. I hope you do too. If there's anything we can do to help you get there, now would be a time to be let that be known while together we stand and we sing the song selected.